Hello and welcome back. I haven't done these videos in a few weeks, so it's very nice to be back. And I look forward to talking about curves, and especially the concept of principal curvatures, which will give a very nice geometric interpretation to both mean curvature and Gaussian curvature. And I think historically that's how those concepts arose, through the concept of principal curvatures. So in order to talk about principal curvatures, we have to talk about curves. So right now, we'll start our conversation about curves. And curves can be seen in two different ways. From one perspective, you can focus on their one-dimensional nature. And we're certainly going to do that, but not right now, probably in a couple of weeks. When you look at surfaces as one-dimensional objects, you can talk about their curvature, their binormal, their you know, other properties like that. Frenet formulas come into play. And it's a very interesting way of looking at curves. Another way of looking at curves it's just like any other surfaces in a higher dimensional space. So a lot of the things that we've already said will carry over to curves. We won't really focus on their one-dimensional nature. And looking at when we do focus on the one-dimensional nature, this perspective that we'll present over the next few videos will actually be adaptable to the new perspective where the one-dimensional property when the one-dimensional characteristics are front and center. But for now, it won't matter. For now, we'll just consider curves as if they were any other embedded surfaces and not pay so much attention to their one-dimensional nature. Of course, if we consider curves in the three-dimensional space, curves are still one-dimensional. And the important part is that they're no longer hypersurfaces. A hypersurface is a surface that only lacks one dimension. So for example, a two-dimensional surface, a two-dimensional surface in a three-dimensional space, or a one-dimensional surface curve in the plane, or maybe on a curved surface. That's actually the more interesting case: curves on curved surfaces. But in the context of a curve, but a curve in the context of a curved surface as its ambient space is actually a hypersurface. But in the three-dimensional space, a curve is a surface but it is not a hypersurface. It's just a one-dimensional uh, manifold in the three-dimensional space. But we can also talk about two-dimensional manifolds in four-dimensional spaces, and then they're not hypersurfaces. And in any embedded manifold that lacks more than one dimension compared to the ambient space, it's no longer a hypersurface. So a few things are a little bit different. So in this short video, I would like to point out the few things that are a little bit different. Um, let's see, is there anything else I want to say as a preamble? Uh, if something comes back to me, I'll definitely mention. But these are the formulas that we would like to discuss. So now imagine a surface. It could be a curve. It could be a two-dimensional surface in a four-dimensional space that's no longer a hypersurface. And I've written very little, but I invite you to think through all of the logic of developing analytical surface and differential geometry on embedded surfaces and just march through all of the steps that we took and think about what holds up and what no longer holds up when you're talking about surfaces that are no longer hypersurfaces. Now without further ado let me fix a typo which is critical and let me just tell you uh, the highlights of what holds up for non-hypersurfaces and what is no longer valid for non-hypersurfaces. So you can think of the left side of the board as the Euclidean description, even though in the four-dimensional uh, case I don't know what a vector is. I cannot visualize geometric objects in a four-dimensional space. So when you're really thinking about vectors, uh, maybe you should be visualizing in a three-dimensional space and going to a higher dimension of space, it's pure uh, stretch of imagination, that's all right also. But so the left side of the board is the Euclidean space. And when we no longer have straight space and no, no longer able to draw straight vectors, even if we could in four dimensional Euclidean space, uh, now if we think about a Riemann space that's no longer assumed straight, then we're just left to dealing with components, which is just as powerful, maybe less visual, but all of the intuition from the Euclidean space comes over to the Riemann space and all of the beautiful geometric concepts survive algebraically or analytically 
And that's really the beauty of the Riemann space. So you can imagine a position vector if you can do it in four dimensions. But in three dimensions, this is still valid for curves. And you can refer to the coordinates on the surface. In the Riemannian space, there's no such thing as vectors, but you can think of equations of the surface that just relates the ambient coordinates to the surface coordinates. Of course, you can construct your basis, your surface basis this way. And I just want you to realize that this still applies to curves. Even though curves are one dimensional and there is only one vector, S sub 1, it's still tremendously beneficial to write an index. Even though in the case of surface, excuse me, curves, alpha can only have one, one value, 1. But that doesn't change any of the structure or any of the vision or the framework. That remains the same. So we're going to continue to use indices. We're going to continue juggling indices. And we're going to continue working with curves as if they were any other surface. And just think of uh, the one-dimensional case as a special case of a more general discussion. So the concept of the covariant basis survives. And of course, the concept of the metric, excuse me, the shift tensor survives without a problem. In the case of curves embedded in surfaces, this would be a three by one system. This would be just a single vector that lives in the ambient, that uh, lives on the curve, but has its values in the ambient space. It doesn't lie within the curve. Or, uh, so that survives. Of course, you can define the metric tensor on the surface or the curve from this covariant basis. You can do the same thing in the Riemann space. Uh, the concept of the covariant derivative obviously survives, and that's perfectly fine. And the same thing happens in the Riemann space. Maybe the Christoffel is defined a little bit differently, but has all of the same properties, and everything is more or less equivalent. So now we're going to come to the interesting part. What happens to curvature? So, of course, the object on the right-hand side remains perfectly valid. You can apply the covariant derivative to the covariant basis. Once again, in the case of a curve, this will be a single vector, but with two indices, 1, 1. Those are the only possible values. Yet, it's very fruitful and really essential to think of this object that has only one entry as a two-dimensional object. It's one by one. So the use of indices is still essential because there is still that metric and you can still raise indices and it changes the value and and that's the only way you can obtain an invariant if, if you cancel all covariant and contravariant indices. So if you want the tensor machinery to continue to work, you have to use indices, even though they only take one value. So the nice thing about everything here is that it's perfectly general with respect to dimensionality. All of this works in any dimensional manifold embedded in any dimensional ambient space. So we can define this object. And here's what we're going to find about it, that it's still orthogonal, each one of these vectors. In the case of a curve, it'll just be one vector. But in the case of a higher dimensional manifold, many vectors. Each one of these vectors is orthogonal to the surface. It'll be orthogonal to the covariant basis. That's very easy to show. In fact, you show it the same way. So let's remember what we said at that point in the case of a hypersurface. What we said was, if each one of these vectors is orthogonal to the covariant basis, it is therefore orthogonal to the surface. It is therefore the normal to the surface, multiplied by some coefficient. And we call those coefficients d alpha beta. This is the moment where the analogy no longer works. Why? Because when the, when the embedded manifold is not a hypersurface. There is no such thing as the normal. Just imagine a curve in a three-dimensional space. There's an, so if a curve goes like this, there's an entire plane where every direction is normal to the surface. There's no one normal. It's now a normal subspace, and that subspace is not one-dimensional. So it's not characterized by a single vector called the normal which is defined up to the sign. So we can no longer say the normal to the surface because it's not a hypersurface. 
So that's the key difference, which makes everything much more interesting in a way. So this object is still normal to the surface. It's just that we cannot say that it's some scalar, some collection of scalars times the normal. We just have to call this object B alpha beta, but it's a vector quantity. It's one by one set of vectors. Or if the manifold is two-dimensional, it's two by two set of vectors. It's still symmetric. It's still normal to the surface. It's just that it's not one vector, the normal, times some scalars. So this becomes sort of a, uh, a standalone object. You might call it the curvature normal tensor or the normal curvature tensor. Uh, doesn't matter what you call it. I call it the alpha beta vector. That's what I really call it. OK, here is an object that's called the curvature normal. When you raise the index and contract, now you get a single vector that's orthogonal to the surface, of course, and is an invariant. So this is called the curvature normal. So maybe this should be called the curvature normal tensor. OK, this is an invariant. Once again, you cannot say that it's some normal vector times B alpha alpha and call B alpha alpha mean curvature. So mean curvature is a concept that only applies to hypersurfaces. When we're no longer dealing with hypersurfaces, if these are non-hypersurfaces, we can no longer say mean curvature. We can still consider this object. It's just that it's no longer proportional to the normal because there's no such thing as the normal. It's normal to the surface, it's invariant, it's beautiful, uh, but it's just not mean curvature. Okay, so that's really the fundamental difference to be aware of. So, in the Riemann space, uh, you would need to resort to this definition. You could still call, it, call this the curvature normal tensor. You can still consider, you can still raise the index I consider this object, it's not an invariant, uh, but it is a tensor. It's obviously analogous to this one. And if you looked at the components of this one with respect to the ambient space, of course, you would get these components. It's just the component version of the same thing. So you can still call it the curvature normal, even though it's no longer an invariant, but just a tensor. So that's the main difference. So let's consider... Let's pause here and consider an example.